today we're here to celebrate the new book by Mina Salami, uh, Sensuous Knowledge, A Black Feminist Approach for Everyone. It's a collection of thought-provoking essays that explore questions central to how we see ourselves, our history, and our world. Nigerian, Finnish, and Swedish, Mina Salami is an author, blogger, social critic, and international keynote speaker. She's the founder of the multiple award-winning blog, Miss Afropolitan, which connects feminism with critical reflections on contemporary culture from an Africa-centered perspective. Listed by Elle Magazine as one of 12 women changing the world alongside Angelina Jolie and Michelle Obama, Mina has uh, presented talks on feminism, liberation, decolonization, sexuality, African studies, and popular culture to audiences at the European Parliament, the Oxford Union, Yale University, TEDx, the Singularity University at NASA, and UN Women. She's a contributor to The Guardian, Al Jazeera, and the Royal Society of the Arts, and a columnist for The Guardian, Nigeria. She lives in London, where she's joining us today. Um, Sensuous Knowledge is available from Booksmith. I'll drop that link in the comments as well, where I hope you'll add any questions that you have. Uh, we'll do a Q&A at the end of the program. That's it from me. Mina, thank you so much for joining us, and congratulations on your book. Thank you, Evan. Thank you very much for having me. And I was just chuckling to myself when you were listing the places that I've spoken that I can now add Zoom um, to that list. So um, thank you very much to everybody that is um, joining the conversation. I'm very honored and delighted to be, to be sharing space with you, um, despite the circumstances of the world. Um, and I'm also really pleased that um, it, Booksmiths has invited me. Um, I think it's really important that we support independent bookstores. So this feels special in that sense. Um, so what I'm thinking I will do is um, I will just briefly talk to you about sensuous knowledge um, to give you a little bit more context and background than Evan just did um, and to share why I wrote the book, where it came from, and what motivated me. Um, and then I will be reading from the book. Um, and I'm going to read for about um, 15 to 20 minutes or so. And I'm reading from the chapter in my book that is titled On Blackness, um, because that's obviously something that is, is, is of relevance and it's timely. Um, but I do want to say that um, the, the whole book here it is, um, Sensuous Knowledge, is, um, is really, in a nutshell, grappling with um, empowerment and liberation. And that is also what we are grappling with right now and have been doing for a long time. Um, so on that note, I, um, well, or Sensuous Knowledge is, it's, it's a collection of essays about universal topics like, um, like blackness um, and knowledge, but also about art and feminism and womanhood and, and beauty. Um, so universal concepts that have a great impact on our lives. Um, and by our, I'm referring in this instance to women and people of African heritage. And yet um, these are concepts that not, have not historically and typically been shaped by us or for us. Rather, they've been shaped against us quite frequently. Um, and I, um, in order to, so I connect the essays, um, they're all interwoven, you could say, by this concept that I, that I refer to as sensuous knowledge. And I develop the concept in the first chapter. Um, but what it is, in short, it's a Sensuous knowledge is, is a synthesis of, of rational thinking and emotional intelligence. So you could say that it is a kind of, um, it's, it's, a, it's a holistic um, and a mind, body, spirit approach to epistemology, which is knowledge production. Um, and the way that I go about creating this, this interweaving and this synthesis, which I refer to as sensuous knowledge, is by, um, is by connecting feminist theory with African philosophy and mythopoetic narratives um, and black liberation um, and a kind of feminine consciousness. Um, because what I want to do with sensuous knowledge is to, to, to provide a holistic 
um, and genuinely empowering paradigm of knowing. And I, I contrast sensuous knowledge with what I refer to as Europatriarchal knowledge. Um, and Europatriarchal knowledge, in, in, in contrast, is, is, a, is a form of knowledge production and a worldview which, um, instead of integrating and synthesizing, is all about fragmenting and dividing. Um, and it, is, it does these things because that is the way that it can become dominant and create hierarchy. Um, and um, why did I, so why I wrote Sensuous Knowledge, the, the, the motivation behind it and, and where it came from um, is many things um, as, as books often are, but it, uh, the key thing that really drove me to writing sensuous knowledge was um, having been writing and speaking about feminism and black liberation and power and liberation um, for over a decade, I found myself and I find myself in, in spaces where there is a great desire um, and intention and, and action um, toward affecting radical change and transformation in society. Um, and yet, it is so difficult. There's always so many obstacles. And, and quite often, we end up just re reproducing the same system, but in a different, in a different kind of outfit. Um, and I have been troubled by why that is. And thinking about it, it's, it became more and more clear to me that we're using uh, like the Europatriarchal definitions of, of our conceptual frameworks um, and trying to produce different results. So for example, if you think about um, power as a concept, um, you know, we want to change a situation, we want to change a structure of power, but if we're using the old narratives about, of power, if we're using the old definitions, then it becomes very challenging to do so. And so for instance, in my chapter about power, I develop a concept that I call exusions that integrates um, all of these things I mentioned earlier, um, African philosophies and black feminist theory and women's in, and in, indigenous ways of knowing and the non-human natural world. Because if we're going to address structures of power, we need to first um, reimagine the language uh, with which we do so. So in a nutshell, I wanted to create a, a paradigm of knowing that would correspond with the causes that I believe in. Um, and of course, Sensuous Knowledge is not the only um, book or endeavor to provide new paradigms of knowledge, but, um, but it is unique in, in, in synthesizing, particularly these kind of feminisms and um, the mythopoetic and African philosophies. So um, I'm going to now read from Of Blackness. And if any of you listening have the book, it is on page, it starts from page 87 of Blackness. I love to be black reads the last sentence in my journal entry of May 31st, 1993. I was going on 15. I wrote the passage a couple of years after moving to Sweden from Nigeria, where I'd spent my childhood. It was likely the first time I'd reflected on blackness and on the racial prejudice I was experiencing in my new hometown, Malmö. A few journal pages later, there are three separate clauses on an otherwise blank page. Black is beautiful. Black power rules the continent. The word black means pride, beauty, and intelligence. It was while working on this chapter that I searched through old journals, journals for clues of when I first began to identify as black. I knew that it wasn't growing up in Nigeria, for if I identified with any color then, it would have been yellow. I never did identify as yellow, but people referred to my complexion with the term. This habit originates with the Yoruba term pupa, translated into English as yellow, but in actuality referring to the entire ochreous range, 
anything orangey, reddish, or tannish is pupa. To be called yellow was either a compliment to suggest exotic looks or an insult implying naivete. Children would sing, Popo is a kind of fruit, sweet like sugar, yellow like Fanta. Everybody likes Popo. It reflected the duality that to be yellow is to be sweet, like Popo, which is papaya, which everybody likes, but alternatively, that you're too sweet for your own good. Although Nigerians generally had an awareness of and felt an affinity with the, the term black on a global and historical scale. It was not how we identified in a national context. This lack of association with the word black may seem understandable. To identify as black within Nigeria, the world's largest black nation, appears inessential, but it is essential. Although blackness isn't a concept that should be taken to rigidly describe ethnic or national belonging, it is of central importance also within Africa because it binds together Africa's descendants socio-historically, so involving social and historical factors. For people of black African heritage, this socio-historical context is the glue that connects us. For all intents and purposes, blackness is a socio-historical context. Yet, my journal entry reveals that becoming black was marked by, becoming black in, in inverted commas, was marked by two factors, none of which were to do with this socio-historical context. First, I grew up in Nigeria where blackness was not an influential concept. Second, I came of age in Sweden where blackness was a cause of blatant discrimination. It was not enough to state that I loved to be black. I accompanied my journal declaration, um, jour journal declaration with clarifications. I love to be black because black is powerful, proud, beautiful, intelligent. A key element in my becoming consciously black was clearly to resist the Euro-patriarchal definitions that claimed otherwise, that blackness was powerless, shameful, ugly, and unintelligent. In other words, rather than with the rich legacies of African heritage people, blackness came with an inherent protest, a need to object to erroneous definitions of blackness and to defiantly assert positive, empowering ones. The need to affirm one's blackness manifests uniquely from individual to individual and group to group. But oppression, defiance, and protest against white supremacy are today seen as tantamount to blackness. One is not born, but rather one becomes black, to extrapolate from Simone de Beauvoir saying, one is not born, but rather becomes woman. Consider Nina Simone's anthem-like song, To Be Young, Gifted, and Black, where she sings that to be young, gifted, and black is where it's at, as these qualities in themselves evoke pride. The word black here is doing something similar to what I did in my journal entries. It is indirectly repudiating negative definitions of blackness by affixing an empowering message to it instead. Simone captures completely this reciprocal process of resistance and reaff reaffirmation in her performance of the song at Morehouse College in Atlanta in 1969. At the end of the mighty show, as the camera glazes over the audience, you can almost touch their rebuke to racist notions of blackness and their corresponding awakening of pride. If you weren't black before you went into this show, you sure were black when you came out of it. Indeed, Simone dedicated the song to the black lesbian feminist playwright, Lorraine Hansberry, who was Simone's mentor and after whose play the song is titled. Simone said, Lorraine, quote, Lorraine started off my political education and through her, I started thinking about myself as a black person in a country run by white people and a woman in a world run by men, 
end quote. If blackness is a political identity to African descendants in the diaspora, on the African continent, there is a hesitation to engage fully with the concept, precisely therefore. We have more than enough to grapple with ethnic rivalry, religious division, psychophantic leadership, arch patriarchy and imperial exploitation, to name a few. Maybe blackness packed with its political baggage is one thing we can forget about. I think there's more to the story. We don't fully embrace blackness because where roles were once re reversed, there is a growing sense of superiority in being African rather than black. There is a pride about the rich ethnic heritage and culture in Africa, and rightly so, but that heritage and culture belong to all people of African descent. Yoruba, Hausa, Igbo, Mende, Zulu, Swahili, Fulani, Bambara, Mandinka, Tigrinya, and Tutsi, even those whose ability to trace their ethnic lineage was disrupted by the transatlantic slave trade. The term Africa is a colonial invention, not used by black people until the 18th century, when authors and activists like Ignatius Sancho and Phyllis Wheatley began to present themselves as African, partly to propagate Christianity, as historian James Sidbury writes in Becoming African in America. The word black, on the other hand, is older than our understanding of ourselves as African. African history is the history of black people and not vice versa. The mere fact that we still have to differentiate sub-Saharan Africa, previously black Africa, speaks to the fact that the term Africa in itself is not synonymous with black. The word Africa, it is widely believed, originated in the word Afrikia, formerly the name used for North Africa, or more precisely, the coastal regions of what today are Western Libya, Tunisia, and Eastern Algeria, which once formed the Roman pro province of Afrikia. Sub-Saharan Africa was referred to separately then, as it still is now. It had multiple names, and all of them had to do with blackness. For example, Ethiopia, the word that once referred to all of black Africa, means black, or literally sunburned in ancient Greek. Similarly, Belad as Sudan, as the Arabs called black Africa, means the land of the blacks. One of the first known human civilizations, the ancient Egyptian, called their civilization Kemet, which means the black land. Mauritania, another term that once meant black Africa stems from Maurus, black in Latin, and informs more. Herodotus, the father of history, wrote about the Nasamonians, which is believed to mean Negroes of Ammon. Nubia was the land of a dark-skinned people and one of the world's oldest civilizations, the Iron Age Nok culture, established around 1500 BCE and located in present-day Nigeria, is believed to owe its name to blackness. The term black itself is one of the world's 23 ultra-conserved words, meaning humanity's oldest words, which have meant mainly the same thing in several language groups for over 15 millennia. I'm not suggesting that these terms had the racial connotation we associate with blackness today. My point is instead that blackness has a long history that goes beyond the modern racial hierarchy system or nationalistic borders. As long as we see ourselves only as African and not black, we will neglect the framing of continuity between history and the present diaspora and continent. There is a hip hop tradition where MCs come together in a circle known as a cipher to share their rhymes and terms. The cipher traveled from various locations in Africa to the diaspora. The same structure is present in the Roda, Roda de Samba, Samba circles of Brazil, where participants take turns entering the center to dance. 
or the Haitian Vodun ritual, where dance is a meditation to ec ecstasy. In the cipher, everyone brings their unique rhymes and styles, and each MC is chaired on by the others. Participants are aware that while there may be playful competitiveness, the variety of styles and voices only enriches the cipher as a whole. There's a call and response element present in the cipher. The combination of verbal and nonverbal communications, words, dance, martial arts, trance, and performance is used toward a goal, and that is to teach and transform. Blackness is a cipher where the conversation is intergenerational, international, and interdependent. The West African talking drums are precursors to calypso, which is a precursor to hip hop, where the talking drums, which are a traditional African technology used to mimic human speech, relay proverbs, we hear poetry in rap. Where there is boasting in rap, there are panegyrics in the talking drums. When a rapper samples, she is evoking the role of the griot passing ancient knowledge to a new audience. In the 1800s, enslaved Africans in the Caribbean already had developed Calypso as a means of documenting their history and providing socio-political commentary. The word Calypso comes from the epic Eastern Nigerian language uh, and the word Kaizo, meaning go on. Here too, we see the polyphonic roots of the talking drums embedded in a new type of sensuous knowledge. The talking drums were not primitive instruments as Europatriarchal knowledge made them out to be. They remain a multi-layered grammar that includes a feminine and a masculine drum language, as well as grammatical tenses. We miss the frame of history that Blackness provides when our entire focus is on its political meaning. The point is not to assert that Blackness isn't at all political, hardly, but we emphasize political Blackness to the detriment of what Blackness also should conjure. The history, the knowledge, the stories, the epics, the civilizations, basically the collective memory of Black people themselves, and not only their painful encounters with whiteness. As Bell Hook says in Postmodern Blackness, it has become necessary to find new avenues for transmitting the messages of Black liberation struggle, new ways to talk about racism and other politics of domination. It is not only Black people who remain oppressed by Europatriarchy, patri black Blackness itself as a concept is unfree. A few years ago, I was invited to give a talk at a liter literary festival in Cachoeira, an enchanting small town in Brazil's largest black state, Bahia. During my trip, I visited the first cemetery for black people in the country. I wondered where black people were buried before then, feeling my heart pierced when I conjured the answers to that question. I had read that enslaved Africans in the US would bury their loved ones facing the West toward Africa. And I took solace in noting that if they cast the dead into the sea behind the cemetery, it pointed homeward. For enslaved Africans, homeward would have been a noun, not an adverb. It would be a country, not an orientation. It would be the last place from which their journey to the diasporas began. Homeward would be a place like Badagri, the beach that my family and I frequently visited when I was a child. But it was also the major slave trading port where Europeans abducted hundreds of thousands of people and enslaved them. Badagri, with the connotations it harbors, is ever present in my awareness. I can never stop thinking about Badagri, needing to visit Badagri seeking to make sense of Badagri. A part of my psyche cannot reconcile those leisurely family resorts Badagri was known for with the people ambushed and sent into the great unknown from there. In Lagos, I find myself longing for landmarks that house the ghosts of homeward and announce the importance of this disastrous event in history, but they are absent. I feel the need to visit a place that doesn't exist, 
I need a place to mourn, honor, and reflect with others who also yearn to acknowledge consciously the wounds of history. Poetry is the place of transcendence, Bell Hook says in Wounds of Passion. And it is true that if we transcend, it will be because we satisfy the urgent need for reflection in Nigeria. We need cultural monuments, museums, and memorials that weave the legacy of slavery and colonialism into the national mythology. Our collective imagination should be shaped by cultural interventions that express the confluence of ambitions that created Nigeria in the first place. How healing it would be to visit modern shrines that honor the gods of retrospection. Sadly, the reluctance of Nigerians to engage with blackness is one of the reasons such sites do not exist. My point is not that we should diminish our African pride. Rather, it is that it is only if we engage with blackness too that we will begin to connect the dots of history and the present. Conversely, without a widespread emphasis on the African context of blackness, the black diaspora more and more fails to connect the struggle against white supremacy with that against the militarily capitalist exploitation of the African continent. Time and again, artists, writers, and activists in the diaspora neglect to connect the black struggle against police brutality or poverty in black communities or prejudice in the West with African realities. Conscious hip hop in the US, for example, often provides biting commentary on racism in law enforcement, but rarely discusses the relationship between US law enforcement and US military bases in Africa. Similarly, for all the radical actions of the Black Lives Matter movement, the failure to tie it together with Pan-African and anti-imperialist struggle beyond rhetoric is a missed opportunity. Blackness instead, centers on resistance to white supremacy, which limits people's understanding of blackness as a socio-historical reality. Blackness remains scarred by what W.E.B. Du Bois described as double consciousness, that sense of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. Blackness also remains shaped by something the writer James Baldwin said in his essay, Princes and Powers, that all black men held in common namely their unutterably painful relationship to the white world. And Martin Luther King, another great avatar of blackness, explained his heated and controversial opposition to the slogan black power in his autobiography by writing, quote, beneath all the satisfaction of a gratifying slogan, black power was a nihilistic philosophy born out of the conviction that the Negro can't win, end quote. We continue to view blackness not merely as a condition of being, but also as a contention of being. For blackness to be liberating, it needs to move away from automatically signifying contention. I don't mean that we should ignore the gross immorality and wicked injustice of white supremacy, or that we should overlook the structural crimes that continue to affect black people everywhere because of white supremacist legacies we should fight the effects of racism to the bitter end. But if anything, that fight needs to be framed by its culprit, whiteness. It is whiteness, not blackness, that transmits a history of racism. I have somehow skipped pages, I think, because I can't find my mark of where to end, but I will, I will end there. I think that's quite fitting for um, many of the conversations that are that are happening currently. Um, yeah. <laughs> that was wonderful, Mina. Thank you so much for reading that. Um, are you are you okay to answer some questions? Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. Um, we have one here um, from Jen Marie um, who says, thank you very much and um, is wondering if you can expand on what you were saying about Samba circles and voodoo circles. Um, and how it connects to a sense of womanhood today. Thanks for the question. Um, the, the, um, uh, what I'm using those examples for is to draw a metaphor um, about 
interconnectivity um, and about space. Uh, and so really to show how, you know, things, the, the cultures, the practices, the knowledge that uh, ancient African societies and civilizations had, have transported to the diasporas in, in, in varying forms. But what they, the, the knowledge remains the same. So it's uh, these ciphers and the samba, the, the roda, the samba circles rather, or wooden um, rituals. And it, there's very many formats of having these kind of circular um, cyclical shared spaces in black communities. Um, and, and what they all do is, is not just about entertainment um, and performance, but it's very much about education and sharing knowledge and sharing knowledge that is transformative. And so um, I, there's, these are obviously mixed gender um, examples, but I think that this metaphor is also really important um, when we look at womanhood and women specifically as well, um, and women of, of African heritage, but, but also all women. Um, because there's a similar, there are similar types of, of lineages um, and spaces. I, I would say, I would argue that feminism is one of those where, you know, there's a kind of uh, a, a knowledge production that really seeks to create revolutionary change. And, um, you know, again, sensuous knowledge being one of these paradigms that is all about these interconnections um, between, and as I said, you know, these are interconnections that are that are international as well as intergenerational in nature. Um, and yeah, um, it's it's they are all always in in contrast to your patriarchal knowledge, which um, where knowledge is very often. It, I, it can be new, neutral, so to speak, without having a particular aim, but it can even more specifically and most of the time have the aim of reproducing a certain dominant hierarchy system. Um, and with these kinds of uh, circular and more interconnected knowledge production methodologies, um, knowledge is very much about transformation in, um, in, a, in a holistic kind of way. I hope that uh, answers the question, but feel free to follow up if, if you have any other points to add. That was wonderful, Nina, yeah, thank you. And yeah, I should, I should say if anybody watching has any questions, please do um, drop them in the uh, comments uh, on Facebook. Um, uh, I, that, that actually brought up a question that, that I had um, um, that, that um, I'm wondering, um, I loved your description of blackness as a cipher and um, how you said that blackness as a concept is unfree. Um, I'm wondering with so many diverse voices around the world right now, um, arguing for the rights of black people. Um, uh, I'm wondering, I'm not sure if I'm phrasing this right really, but I'm wondering if, if, if this cipher, so to speak, needs to be protected in some way or further defined. Um, and, and also what blackness as a concept that is free might look like. Well, yeah, that's a really um, important point and great question. Um, so, you know, I think what is happening right now has, uh, you know, it's because it's so intense and so immediate and we're, and we're following uh, the unfolding events, you know, on a daily, if not an hourly basis. Um, and so, you know, right now, the, the part of blackness that in a sense I'm, I'm critically questioning, which is connected to, to protest and defiance against white supremacy, has, has the, the forefront, you could say. Um, but I think, and what I'm doing in, in this chapter, as I'm doing with all of the chapters in my book, um, and looking at these concepts, is taking more of a, of a long-term view. Um, and so to respond to your question, I think um, the cipher, or if we call it the long-term view, um, I, it's, it doesn't feel as, 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 um, as urgent right now, but precisely therefore, I think it is because, you know, we, we need to be mindful to not forget that, like, what we are hopefully 
in a revolution against um, is these kinds of limiting, this unfree nature of blackness in itself. And, and not only um, as urgent and important as the structural um, white supremacist systems that govern our world everywhere um, still are, but it's, you know, we have to, it, and, and really that is where the, the cipher also um, symbolizes and represents these, these multi-layered and multifaceted elements of blackness. Because if you, if you think of the hip hop cipher, you know, one person might come in and talk about the, the relationship to whiteness, um, but then the next uh, performer might step in and educate about, um, about the socio-historical context of blackness. Um, and, and, and I think that this is something that is absolutely urgent and important right now. Um, you know, we, we obviously, we need the people who are out there on the front lines um, resisting and protesting and demonstrating and, you know, breaking apart the, the systems of domination that have killed way too many black people. We also need the narrative to be framed as something that is ultimately going to produce joy and not contention, you know, because to be in that, that, that state of contention constantly is, um, you know, it's, it's a textbook definition of, of anxiety and uh, a way of not being able to function in the world. Like you, you can't be healthy, you can't be joyful. Uh, from that state. So, the, the, you know, the, the two um, overarching prisms that I've been discussing here need to work more in tandem. Thank you, Mina. That was a wonderful answer um, for, a, for a tough question. Um, I, I don't think I have any that are that, are that tough. Um, uh, anymore, <laughs> but, uh, but I do have some audience questions that are coming in. Um, uh, the next one comes from, from Pia or Paya. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Um, um, they're wondering, um, in your book, you mentioned about decolonization and language um, being, in language being a part of decolonization and attempts to recreate languages that could still unify beyond cultural lines, but not be part of colonizers' weapon, uh, weapons of racism and patriarchal rule. Um, so they're wondering, what advice or vision do you have for someone who's seeking for language to create liberation or to create liberation through the use of language? Wow, um, I'm so glad you asked that question because it's, it's the central point of all this, this work um, that we do collectively. Um, and we don't, we don't talk about that enough. Uh, and so my response to that, and you know, that's what sensuous knowledge advocates, is that you know, whatever issue we're looking at, um, you know, be it racism, patriarchy, or even the issues in our own personal lives, you know, there's always obstacles that we face that are often connected to these, to these systems, um, is to basically look at, to integrate um, your approach or our collective approaches with the things that I've mentioned, so feminist theory, but also um, bringing art into the equation. You know, if we're, if we're in, resistance against neocolonialism, what we tend to do, which is how the Euro patriarchal knowledge system has, has schooled us, is to um, approach it with, you know, this kind of rigid binaries and, um, and very strictly uh, looking at things with a, a logical mind. Um, and because that isn't reality, because we are humans and living in ecosystems with nature and other humans um, and we are impacted by you know by the things that we embody by by um, uh, our feelings and our dreams and our spirits um, and all of these things um, we have to bring in all of the varying approaches to tackle the problem so if we're thinking about decolonization, yes, we need the statistics, we need the, the seminars and the think tanks and the indices and all of that. But we also need the imaginative, we need the art, we need to dance, we need to heal, we need to learn from indigenous communities, we need to learn from nature. Um, and we need, if, if we're not 
integrating all of these things. We're only um, trying, because it's almost impossible to succeed, but we're trying to decolonize, you know, like a, a tiny part of the whole. Um, so yeah, with any issue, what sensuous knowledge advocates is, is bring in multifaceted uh, approaches to, to the solution. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Um, questions are, are flying in now um, uh, due, due to your, your brilliant answers. Um, I have one here from Faith Adiele. Hi, Faith. Um, Faith says, so great to see you here, Nina. I have so many things I want to talk about. Um, I and others have been trying to start a Nigerian Me Too movement for years, and I'm wondering if you have thoughts or advice around the we are tired stories happening right now simultaneously in this moment of limited Nigerian support for, for BLM? Um, yeah, this is, th this has been uh, a real challenge for us in, in Nigerian society, like in so many places everywhere in the world. I think we're still only just with the tip of the iceberg of, of talking about sexual violence and abuse and discrimination against women. Um, I have not followed the most recent conversations in depth, um, but I, from what I have seen, it has made me th think very much about how far we have come. Um, because it just, I had a moment yesterday when it felt so surreal to me that, you know, all over the, the Nigerian, um, you know, social media spaces. And I saw that there were live talks going insta live conversations happening about rape um, and sexual violence in Nigeria. And this, this is actually unbelievable. Um, and so I, I, I'm not saying that we don't have a long way to go. We still absolutely do. But I think it's also important to just take a moment to, to notice that we are having conversations that only three, four years ago would have seemed completely impossible. Um, and so we need to just keep, keep amplifying these conversations. But again, um, with this sensuous knowledge, with, you know, let's, let's bring in more um, room for a feminine consciousness, for for healing, for embodiment, for, um, you know, getting together and dancing out our rage. And I, I don't know, but all of these kinds of formats are also very important. And they're especially important in societies like Nigeria, where um, because of the Europatriarchal knowledge structures and Afropatriarchal ones, if, if I can add that too, um, as a terminology here, um, women, so many women don't have access to uh, the, the, the indoctrinating type of educational systems. Like they're not, and people don't have access to the internet and all of this kind of thing. So um, I, I hope um, and think it would be useful for the next stages in, in our feminist conversations in, in African society, but also everywhere to just bring in more of the embodied and you could say existentialist character of the struggle. Nice to meet you too, Faith. I can't see you, but <laughs> I, I appreciate that you're here. We've, we've been in contact many times online. Oh, thank you, Nina. Um, the next question that I have comes from Bahi. Um, and, and Bahi, please um, weigh in if, if I'm not um, communicating your question um, correctly. But I think the essence is, um, um, Mina, they're hoping that you can speak a little bit more about Africa and Nigeria specifically, and the impact of recognizing the slave trade, um, uh, specifically how that interacts uh, in terms of it being part of the education there um, with um, recognizing um, one's blackness, um, as that's something that people might not think about until they're no longer part of that society and um, are looking at it uh, from the outside. Hi, Bahi. Um, thanks. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I am arguing in, in, in the chapter, that there's a, um, or basically I'm trying to understand why we don't engage with 
uh, the history uh, and the consequences of the transatlantic slave trade in Nigeria um, in any kind of, you know, sufficient scale. Uh, we obviously are aware of it, we learn a little bit about it, but this should be at the very center of our national discussions. Um, and uh, in the chapter, I, I, I suggest that it is because, uh, or at least it's partly because, we are grappling with so many other issues that we feel um, as if that isn't something that we should, or that we want to, to, um, to add to the, to the conversations. But again, this is a, this is a direct result of Europatriarchal education because it, you know, as long as it, it, it we have an educational system and a, not only like in school, I'm talking about a whole like cultural, philosophical, social, and civic education that encourages so much fragmentation in how we think about issues that, you know, that, that especially those kinds of issues that have such lasting consequences over generations, um, then we're not going to be able to solve the issues that we have today or in any given specific moment. Um, if, if there's one message that I hope I, I leave um, with my book and with anybody listening right now, it is this importance of interconnection, of synthesis, of amalgamation, of interweaving, whatever you want to call it. But the, the, the big problem with every single um, system of dominance and its effects is that they are the result of, the, of fragmentation and division. Um, and so, yeah, like that's, that's another thing. It's in, similarly to with um, sexual violence and sexual discrimination, um, the, the, the history of enslavement of African people, it is mad that we don't see how relevant of a conversation that is for us to have. You know, it's, it's just absolutely mad. But, but yeah, we've, we've, we've got to start. And we've got to push and build on those conversations that are happening because they they exist, of course. Um, and you know, we we one of the things that uh, sensuous knowledge is also about, um, and and this is why, you know, it's it's connected to the black feminist canon because black feminism has um, number one always been about. Um, <laughs> integrating issues because black women knew that, you know, our oppression is, is race, gender, and often class based. So there's that instant connection of tackling these issues together. And then also because black women in Europatriarchy have uh, all over the world are prevented from uh, entering uh, institutions of power, whether it's politics or education, like, you know, these were just in recent history starting to have some access and it's still very difficult. So we have always had to use um, alternative methods to transmit knowledge. So, um, you know, in my book, I give a lot of examples about this, whether it's storytelling or art or um, planting gardens as Alice Walker uh, and her mother did. It's there. There are just um, so many different ways of producing knowledge that that black feminist um, theory and activism have produced. And so, yeah, that's that's the key message here. It is to to really approach life, um, not only politics, but even on our in our own personal lives. Um, there is a tremendous healing and empowerment that can be derived from, from seizing and just refusing to think about things in fragmented ways, which is what the oppressor wants us to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. Um, I um, have a lot of a good questions still um, for you. Um, uh, the next one, I think, um, uh, comes from, uh, from Grace. Grace is asking, how do we engage men in the idea that it is not enough to be not um, misogynist uh, in the same way that we are seeing many people waking up to the realization that it's not enough to be not racist um, and engage men in the practical dismantling of the patriarchal systems 
uh, that are so deeply damaging uh, to all genders. Uh, I, thanks. That's that's an, that's that's important, and and it's also a very fascinating thing to think about. In so far that there might be more resistance from men um, when it comes to this, um, but we have to refuse to engage with that kind of sexist thinking. Um, and you know, I was saying in jest uh, on Twitter some days ago that like the the kind of karmic energy of the universe is dismantling everything like COVID-19 um, has really put in our faces the problems with capitalism um, and, and, and ecocide. And now with uh, the callous murder of George Floyd um, and the, the demonstrations, we have you know, racism being dismantled um, in front of our eyes. And, and so, yeah, my, my just comment was that, you know, likely there's going to be something that will put sex discrimination at the forefront very soon in a big way. Um, th there needs to be, because I think that that is, um, you know, it's the oldest form of discrimination. Um, and it's the one on which so many others are based. And it is very difficult for men to undo their, their sexism, sexism being uh, the belief that you are superior because you're male. Um, and there's that little seed of that belief. Um, I mean, it's, it's just like with whiteness, when you're born male, it is planted in you from the very beginning. And so that seed is always there. And if you, you know, if you give it even a little tiny bit of water, it just, blooms into this huge poison ivy, maybe we should say, rather than anything, anything delightful. And yeah, I guess, you know, the, the, what we do as, as feminists, and, you know, I, I, I think men can be feminists. Um, I think, or we might call them conscious, um, aware men. Uh, what we all do together is to deprive that seed of any water. Uh, you know, uh, but it, it is likely going to need something, something hopefully not too like drastically, um, you know, I think we've had enough drastic events for, for 50 years now. <laughs> so hopefully nothing as drastic as what is happening, but um, something that's going to take, that's going to make men realize the importance and the necessity of this shift um so yeah thank you yeah that that actually reminds me um uh, of uh, uh something that you wrote in the introduction of the book um uh, you, you wrote that there's no point in smashing the patriarchy as many western feminisms claim to do without fighting imperialism and capitalism um and i'm wondering um I'd love to just talk about that all day, really. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about it and, and just, is it, is it incomplete um, to advocate, for instance, for an anti-racist world um, uh, without calling for one that is anti-capitalist? Um, and, and maybe my question is more so, um, what, um, how do we advocate for everything all at once? You know, um, you, you point out, um, you know, you're you kind of in jest that you expect um, some some um, kind of uh, attention to be drawn to um, issues of of, uh, of um, misogyny, um, and and when these issues are kind of laid bare um, in the public consciousness, we tend to want to um, focus solely on those, right? And and um, uh, how how can we transcend all of these separate um, problems? Um, to to, to I, know, I know you have the easy answer. <laughs> <laughs> a very easy task to answer that question in, in a few minutes. Uh, no, but it's it's very valid and it is really central to to this discussion because, um, and you know, again, we it's understanding that the the it the problem is the fragmented. I feel like a bit of a parrot now, but the problem is really that way of uh, perceiving the world. It's a worldview problem, you could say. Um, with all of these, with racism, with climate change, with sexism, with capitalism, 
um, imperial, like all of these really are, you know, if you, if you really think about it, it is, they're informed by the same worldview. Uh, I happen to call it Europatriarchal knowledge. Um, it's, it's because from that, you're forever, uh, if you have that knowledge system, you're forever wanting to, to accumulate power in a particular kind of way, um, which is competitive and all about ranking and quantification and all of these things. And it becomes, it's impossible to use that paradigm of knowing that worldview to, to change anything. Um, and so once you, you know, to say, to answer the question of how we, we see, we connect all of these, um, because otherwise it's draining. Like if we think, oh God, like, you know, on Monday I'm going to fight uh, against white supremacy and then Tuesday <laughs> against male dominated, like, you know, who, who has, who has the capacity for that? I mean, and unfortunately a lot of people are approaching it this way and burning out. And this is what I think, you know, self, care also can come into this and in, in that it is actually what we need is to look at this holistically and stop putting all of this energy into uh, very worthy fights but draining ourselves um, and so yeah um, I, I you know and with the, the piece the, the line that you read um, that there's no point in trying to smash the patriarchy without imperialism and capitalism you know if you if if you think about it western patriarchies how are they empowered where do they get their money their their manpower their human power we should say um you know where is all of that coming from if not predominantly from the global south i mean all of the natural resources all of the the land the oil the coltan for your phones all of this stuff that ultimately empowers uh, Western patriarchies because all nations are patriarchal, right? Um, if you're if you're just trying to smash the the patriarchy without looking at these structures, what are you doing? Because they they are getting their power from these structures. So so that's why. Thank you. I think you, you did a great job answering that very very uh, difficult question. Thank you for. Um, you keep maybe. throwing all the very difficult questions at me. <laughs> what <do> you, <laughs> I, know, I know we have a limited time with you, so we want to want to make the best the most the best use of it. Um, I have I have just two more, and I think these are these are a little bit simpler um, for you. Um, one is uh, is from Erin, and um, and Erin thanks you for sharing all of this. Um, she's looking to align herself with feminine revolutionaries and wonders if you have any recommendations of revolutionaries whose work in life have inspired you. I'm sure, I'm sure you do, but we'd love to hear them. Uh, well, this question always throws me um, because there, there are just so many and it feels like, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to limit. Um, I think really though, what I want to say is, you know, just start with reading, let's say, uh, a bell hooks or an Audre Lorde and or Toni Morrison, um, Vandana Shiva, Marie Mies. Well, actually now I guess I'm, I am listing <laughs> a, a, a number of people who I'm greatly influenced by. Um, or, you know, more contem contemporarily, you have your uh, Chimamanda Adichie's and um, Monail Tahawi, Grada Kilomba is a, is a, a, a Afro-Portuguese writer who, whose work I love. Um, but what is um, important when you're reading all of these works and you're building your, your feminist revolutionary uh, compendium of, of knowledge for action is, um, is really that you're formulating your own vision of what feminist revolution looks like for you. Um, so that is at least how I hope that readers engage with my book. Um, you know, I'm looking at, at big philosophical concepts. So obviously I'm not, uh, the, the, the writing is not by any means um, definitive of these concepts. And so, you know, I hope that, that you will read my book and think, oh, this, this is a, a revolutionary spirit that, you know, I, I would like to build on in this way or challenge in that way. Um, because ultimately, what feminist revolution um, really is about 
is for women to come to a place where we are self-reliant. Um, but that's a topic for another day. But it's really, there's just one thing to say and to bear in mind is that what patriarchal structures quite specifically do is, um, is disable and disempower women from self-reliance. So even when reading, even when just engaging with art, with culture, with knowledge, one of the things to bear in mind is how can this help me become more self-reliant while still be compassionate and part of community. Thank you, Mina. Um, I, I, I tried to take a list and no, uh, notes of, of the people that you recommended. Um, I might need to um, confer with you after though to, to share them. To send. And also just one thing to add to that, um, you know, these are all writers, but again, um, a, a message, I want to encourage everybody to also look for femin feminist revolution in, you know, in ancestral knowledge, in, in arts, pottery, um, myths, uh, and all of these kinds of things, which, which also have very strong messages of, of empowerment. Thank you. And, and, um, and I mentioned at the in my introduction that I would um, drop a link to our featured, our front um, table books, which I think so some of which um, will, um, will speak to, to these uh, feminist revolutionaries. Um, uh, so I will, I will drop that in shortly. Um, my, my last question, um, it, it comes from um, Adrian. Adrian is, is wondering um, about the, um, what you said earlier about um, about the word black being um, being so um, old, I think you said like fifteen millennia, um, uh, and Adrian's wondering um, uh, how how does this compare with other similarly um, old terms? Um, uh, that that was an interesting point you made. I, I like what what were the what are those thirty you know protected yes, words? Twenty three ultra conserved words. Um, I can't remember exactly what they are. Um, white is not one of them. Um, many of them are quite to do with like tools, uh, things that our, our, our ancestors would have needed. The only one uh, that's, that really struck me was, was black. So um, that could have any kind of social and political meaning, but um, I'm glad you asked that because I'll, I'll double check, but from the 23 are not, um, none of them were really about any, any kind of social, psychosocial context for me. Thank you. Um, so yeah. I, yeah. oh, I, I see we have one more question come in. Do we have time for it? Sure. Yeah. That okay. Thank you, Nina. Um, so this comes from Cecile, um, who says, thank you so much for talking to us. Is there a consensus between black people in the U.S.? to advocate for the education of all Americans about the richness of black history and the diversity of black cultures. If there is a consensus in the US, um, I, I mean, I don't know, like I'm sure that there are individual institutions, probably those that have been set up by, you know, groups of people that support movements like Pan-Africanism, uh, and black liberation. Uh, but what I do know for sure is that there's not enough of that. Um, and I think that that is evidenced by our, by US culture, US black culture and black culture everywhere. Like none of us are really doing the work of connecting the socio-historical um, relationship strongly enough. Uh, you know, and I'm speaking now of like the visual mainstream culture again like there are obviously independent groups who are who are promoting this but i think i i you know nothing could could be more important right now because this is this is who we are you know it's not about fabricating uh some kind of afro romantic history in order to make ourselves feel good vis-a-vis -vis what white supremacists have told us it is actually the truth and the social historical context has many negative elements to it as well. You know, like the there's there's a definite history of uh, what we could would now call uh, classism. You know, some kind of aristocratic values, which I write about in my book as well, with like going dating back to ancient Egypt. Um, there's obviously the question of patriarchy and all of these things. So, but it's. The point is that the socio-historical context is the container of 
the memories of the histories of the of the epics and all of these things um, and so we do need to we do need to to push for that i mean the ultimate goal is that that is the education that that children receive because why is it that you know little black children are taught about race from a very early age they're taught that you know you're not going to have the you're, they're taught that blackness is something that is going to deprive them in life and that is going to have to make them extra behave extra this and extra that whereas white children are not taught about race sometimes until you know they're they're adults um, when it is actually white children who are going to grow up and and uh, you know at worst take advantage of the racial hierarchy but but you know it's it's this weird dynamic and so the ultimate goal is that we're going to teach black children from an early age, we're going to emphasize the socio-historical context while still obviously also talking about whiteness as, as the transmitter of this racial history. Um, and I, th I, I don't think that, you know, pushing an agenda for this to happen in itself is the solution. It is just really understanding it. It's, you know, it's seeing it. It's the, the clarity is always the first step because when you, when you see something, you know, if you're a parent, for instance, you, you have this inside of the socio-historical context and your child is being taught something else, you will be able to fill the gaps and, and teach the child where to question and where to probe and feed their curiosity. And that's how change eventually happens. So it's really about informing ourselves, informing ourselves through reading, but as I've been saying throughout, also through um, music, art, culture, poetry, eroticism, all of, all of everything that encompasses life. Thank you, Mina. Thank you so much for this brilliant conversation and for being so generous with us today. Um, and congratulations on the book. Um, uh, the book is Sensuous Knowledge, A Black Feminist Approach for Everyone by Mina Salami. Um, you can follow Mina at her blog, Ms. MsAfropolitan.com and buy the book from Booksmith and we'll ship it right to your door. Uh, free shipping in San Francisco. Um, thank you all so much. Please be well and stay safe and speak up. Um, thank you, Mina. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.